Hey, yo, turn it up as loud as it go. Come on, hold on. Please, welcome. This is Hill and Chill as Fuck the Podcast. It's your boy, Tristan Mitchell, licensed clinical social worker with Soko Ray Therapy. And it's me, your girl, Soko Reynoso, a.k.a. Soko Ray, owner of Soko Ray Therapy, licensed clinical social worker. And this is Robin Dial, associate clinical social worker with Soko Ray Therapy and resident hip-hop head with this therapy for us by us. Hill and chill as fuck. as fuck podcast. We're in here, baby. Let's get it. Get it, get it, get it, get it. Welcome back to another episode of Hill and Chill as fuck. As fuck. It's so cool. Tristan. Robbie Rob. Let's get it. Oh, man. We are back and we getting this shit going on the kicking it off on the right foot. So, yeah, I know. Let's dive into it. What's in your mug, in your mug? What you got in your mug? I like my drinks stiffer than these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I have. No, we all have the same thing. That's uh, what she said. <laughs> we out here sipping these, uh, what we sipping? Awesome. These Moscow Muse by Yo Fave Bartender, our Fave Bartender. Cheers. Yo Fave. Cheers to a new week clink, in the booth. Robin, you always miss me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh. I'm mad we had to remake the clink though, because we ain't these. <laughs> we, we 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 ain't even in mugs. We in cups. We We're being <laughs> frugal during COVID. <laughs> um, let's dive into these check-ins. How, check how y'all in. feeling? I feel it has been a beautifully emotional last two weeks. I'll say I have been in a state of noticing so much good. Like Rob created something, a, a video, and she texted to me last night, and legit, I cried. I was so just like moved that you can be so creative. I was moved that I have a squad. Like seeing everyone's faces together on that video was like shit. Squad, so like you built a team, and everyone looks happy. Like we're all happy to be yep. therapists together. So I am on a cloud of gratitude. Nice. I'm on that same cloud. Because um, I was just talking about this earlier, just about um, how I never knew how powerful like vis- visualization was until I really saw some things come into fruition. And this is like part of it, like being here, being with you guys. And it's just like I've learned to change my perspective on a lot of things, even with all that's been going on. It's just like like seeing all of the greatness that comes out of this situation like my creative juices are just out here in these in these streets right now y'all ain't ready get ready (laughs) i can't wait yeah so i'm actually i'm feeling really good today um yeah yeah i feel like we're all we we all me tooing right now but uh i'd say gratitude definitely busy as fuck uh tired as fuck but pushing myself to shift it to see it through a lens of gratitude because As we said, there are tons of people right now who aren't in a space where they can be busy and they can have opportunities knocking at that doorstep. So uh, really checking myself before I even complain. And even when I say tired as fuck, not in a, oh, I need a break type of way, but this is a good type of tired. I would prefer to be tired doing shit I love with people I love and life's happening. Um, Yeah, the, the Mitchell household has been pretty solid through these duo pandemics, <laughs> that racism and that COVID we've been tackling. Y'all got um, each other's backs. I like that you said that because I've been feeling busy too. And I was with a friend and I'm like, oh, these emails never stop. And he was like, that's a good problem. Please don't forget. There's people who are waiting on correspondence who aren't getting it. So take it mm-hmm. in gratitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. See your busyness. If you're making mistakes, it's because you have an opportunity to do something to make a mistake. So just reframing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, for before we before we dive into our topic, uh, going off one of me and Rob's favorites, the Nat Ministry, it will probably <laughs> even argue if you ain't tired as fucking if you ain't busy, then still be grateful because now you have this opportunity to rest and to really see rest as a form of resistance too, especially living in this go, go, go society we live in. So I think it's balanced there too. We're definitely grateful to be busy, but also absolutely encourage any of you out there who aren't busy to try to find some gratitude in this opportunity to rest and hopefully the situation or circumstances aren't so intense where that's like not even uh fathomable if if if, is that a word i think so we're gonna make it work shoot (laughs) they call me the nap queen Uh, give me a nap five ten minutes 
New person. To huh? three hours. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know. <laughs> um, All right. So we're going to move on into today's topic. And today we're talking about somebody do a drum roll. Relationships. <laughs> Romantic relationships. And we should be um, very not cautious we should be very careful to make sure that we are including all kinds of romantic relationships not just heterosexual mm-hmm. i think that's mm-hmm. important but you know it, many of more are heterosexual than not so i think many of our references will be from a male female standpoint but know that we are aware that there are other dynamics that exist. yeah absolutely where y'all where y'all want to start with that i'll i want to start with let's start with the socialization of people in preparation for romantic relationships. And I'll speak to um, mostly like what it's like as a female, right? And I, and I don't know, Tris, like Disney movies for you, was that a big thing? Were you excited when one came out? I didn't give a fuck. <laughs> um, for, for me, I kind of skipped that whole, I ain't gonna say I didn't watch Disney movies because I'm sure I did, but my mind is already taken to me. I feel like when people was watching Disney, I was watching Boys in the Hood. Like, my older brother is almost five years older than me, so we kind of grew up living in his world. And I think appropriately so. Like, it didn't, as far as I know, I'm sure some argue it didn't damage us any. Um, So we kind of grew up living in that world. So we definitely watched cartoons and did different things. But I want to say we weren't the household. I remember going to people's house, and they had, like, every fucking Disney movie in the little vhs cassette and it was all lined up that 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 wasn't us mm. um so i wonder if that's the case for most men if if disney is clung to more tightly by young girls than young boys i think that's probably fair yeah that yeah that's true. i think the the idea of prince charming comes along later for men i don't know that they necessarily learn it from the fairy tales like we do Chris, so tell me this i'm we're gonna get to the females but i'm gonna get curious about your experience um what let, what messages did you get about what a man should be in romantic relationships? Hmm. How he should be, what he should be, what he should give, what he shouldn't give? I think I had uh, really dope examples um, of what a man should be in relationships. And I know that I'm fortunate in that way. I'm not at all saying that um, my examples were, were perfect. But I think in terms of like those core values, they were solid. My dad is... At this age, I look back and I absolutely got my chivalry from him. My dad's a protector. My dad is loyal. Um, That showed up in my household. Um, I watched teaming like my parents definitely teamed and 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 tackled things together. So that for sure was, you know, a part of uh, a part of our experience as well. So I think those core lessons of loyalty, those core lessons of, um, again, uh, showing up, protecting um sometimes probably to a flaw like i for sure pick my dad's hella defensive of my mom and i'm hella defensive of shamila and sometimes i try to check in with self and wonder is it like too much not in like a controlling crazy way but like probably in public like you she can't be wrong like she's right and then maybe we'll talk about it in the car but like i'm always gonna hold you down in public Mm -hmm. so i'd say those have been like my core values of oh and you know protect provide so in a sense, I say some of those traditional ones, but then also saw where, you know, I don't know where the guy was cooking or doing these things that society says is more of the female role. So and my mom, um, having raised four sons and she was the only woman in the house, we didn't really have that tradition. She was like, yo, I'm not cooking every fucking day. So we had <laughs> we to cook. You, we Mitchell. we had to clean. We had to do these things. So I think in a good way, we also didn't grow up with these like strict gender role ideals. I showed up. I remember Shamila was like, I don't cook. Now I find out she said it because she was like, she didn't want to set the expectation that she would. And when she said she oh, didn't wow. cook, I was like, cool, I cook for myself. Like, I got you. I know how to cook. It wasn't an issue and for you. No. She's like, you passed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'd say probably some of those traditional values you've, you've mentioned from mm-hmm. my dad and my, grand, my grandpa's. I think uh, I, part of my experience, there's, it's so complex if you try to undo what you or figure out what you have learned and been socialized to be. I know that I felt this strife between figuring out how to need someone. There's a problem. That's a problem. And how to also be strong and independent, right? Like the, I, that, had, that was confusing for me always. Like how do I make sure I'm good and also be a lover? Um, and I didn't subscribe fully to the whole Disney stuff. But what I 
did subscribe to is this idea that you'll know when you know and it's this magical feeling and I've come to unlearn that I guess we'll get to the unlearning part but it's it it would it wasn't love or couldn't make the cut for love if it didn't seem out of this world my experience with Disney fairy tales more so um that now I I think differently is the idea of the happy ending like you know you ride off into the sunset and then everything is amazing and wonderful from then on but I would love to see (laughs) the movie after (laughs) I would love to see Cinderella in Snow White in their 60s yeah you know what I'm saying how that all turn out for you yeah (laughs) being pissed off at Prince Charming (laughs) because they tired of his shit no (laughs) he had two kids on the side you know what I'm saying like oh they're Oh, so you gonna save somebody else up in the, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, while I was sleeping, Sleeping Beauty, you remember when I was like, you know what I'm saying? You thought I was all that, and you know, you came and kissed me and whatever, and now, now you off kissing other bitches or whatever, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but seriously, no, nah, but like, I mean, that's the, the reality is, is that, you know, these fairy tales, uh, including like these rom com, you know, romantic comedy movies, they give this idea that um finding love or being in love all exists in one way or or happens in one way um and then it also creates creates this uh, false sense of uh reality for us because even in our logical brain we know this is a movie right this isn't how it really is but we feel these feelings that come with watching that movie like oh i the want love. that yeah and so it like subconsciously it impacts us because i know for me when I was younger, I would meet a guy that I liked, you know, and immediately my mind would go there. It would go to what that fantasy looked like, that mm-hmm. fairy tale of like, ooh, what is 100%. he going to look like when he's dressed in his tuxedo and I'm walking down the aisle, what my wedding's going to be like. And, you know, even shows nowadays, we may not have those same type of fairy tales, but we got say yes to the dress. We got platinum weddings. We got all these things that continue this narrative of like, um, connecting to the idea of something as opposed to the actual person that you're with Mm. and so I feel like you know when you're young you're connected to that you're connected to the idea of what that feels like what that looks like to have this person on my arm to be in this relationship it's like about the meaning of that versus like have we really explored the person that we are with are we actually really compatible or do we just look cute together on instagram right. look at us out on vacation looking like we pop it you There's know what so i'm much saying more to meanwhile we don't even know this person's values like damn do you even want to have kids oh how are you trying to raise these kids or like do you know do you even believe in marriage what kind of marriage do you believe you know what i'm saying all these mm-hmm. things that we don't think about we're just already on to the fantasy of the happily ever after the things that we've like kind of you know been conditioned or you know socialized to believe from family and then also it's the pressure of like uh having to be in these relationships if not there's something wrong with right. us you know right. it's just you know as you're as you're saying that what's uh what's coming to mind for me is also that's usually when the ball drops right when people and even i think at all ages uh I think about our own relationship in general, there's always that point where the ball drops and not drops like this person has let you down, but where if you look back and you have the, the, the tools to look back reflectively, you can be like, when that ball dropped, it was because I finally had to do, like you said, and start addressing reality. And I was mm-hmm. living in the idea and I was like stuck in this idea of all of these good times and these good days. And um, the thing that Shamila said that was most helpful um, and it was early on. We, we, I think I mentioned this in an episode. We kind of hit the ground running, but she mentioned early on. I think we maybe hadn't even been dating a month. And typical, like, the idea, like, I'll never hurt you. I'll never. And she was like, yes, you will. She was like, you will hurt me. And that's okay because people, people hurt people. Yeah. And she was like, so pretty much she was like, so don't sit here and tell me no shit. That, like, that's not true. And it wasn't in like this. It wasn't in a mean, aggressive way, but it was in a real way. And I appreciated it because at the time I was like, eh. And looking back, it's like, it's inevitable. Whether you're going to do life with somebody, even a month for somebody, it's inevitable to hurt them. And you can't really go on record and say, I won't hurt you because that, is, that assumes that I know what hurts you. Like, maybe me missing your call a couple of days hurt you, maybe whatever. So 
I think, like you said, moving out of the idea and really getting to know the person and really figuring out who are you, where can we, where can we mesh? And then through that, maybe I'll learn your vulnerabilities and I'll really know what will hurt you. And yeah. I could have tried to avoid those things versus my projections of what hurts or, or doesn't hurt. So I like you bringing up the, when we get stuck in the idea, I don't think we ever outgrow that. No, we, you have to, it's like, it's like anxious thoughts, right? You have to mm-hmm. actively work to combat them and be like, that's not actually reality. And I'll stay in pain if I continue believing that mm-hmm. to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, oh, go ahead, Rana. I was going to switch subjects, so. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, again, going back to how uh, we see programming that makes us feel a certain way. Like, funny, my mom grew up on, like, shows like Leave it to Beaver and stuff like that. And her idea of that, as far as, like, what family was supposed to look like everything is perfect and wonderful and everybody loves each other you have your little mishaps but it's like you know at the end of the day it's it's all love and we're back and it's like she wanted a household like that but it was like that wasn't real that wasn't like reality and it's like the same thing with these like where we see these relationships like in my mom was a non-traditional woman in the sense because she was like the breadwinner she was going to work she controlled a lot of uh the finances my dad was the cook so in my mind i'm kind of conflicted because i'm like okay i see these gender roles and whatever but that's not happening in my house so like i don't know where i stand and i'm not i guess a traditional female because i you know i was with my dad for the most part because my mom would be working and so he raised me like a son. <laughs> so I'm all into basketball and whatever. So I was all confused as to how to present mm. myself when it came to men. Because am I a friend? <laughs> I present like your, your homeboy, but then you kind of like me. So I was like, there was a lot of confusion for me in trying to choose people because I didn't know how... I always felt like I had to be a certain something mm-hmm. to to make men feel comfortable. Mm. Yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. 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 Um, OK, so I would like to transition some and we can we can kind of go all over and however um, about this concept of wholeness, okay. because I know that a lot of people struggle with that, not just in relationship, but the way I've seen it used is like make sure you're whole before the relationship and you don't have the relationship yet because you're not whole and like this chase for wholeness. Mm. And I remember when I was active in church, I was just like, wait, what, what is wholeness? And what does that look like? And does it mean I have to come to church every Sunday? And how much scripture do I need to know? And if I don't memorize it, am I not? And like, what is whole? And I don't know, do, do you guys remember receiving similar messages about wholeness? Or what was your experience with the concept of wholeness? I didn't really have that experience of wholeness. I had, you know, always been told, like, no matter what I accomplish, if I'm not in a relationship, I'm incomplete in some way. Like, I need, Mm. like, when you're going to get married? When you're going to have these babies? You know, obviously, I've been married and divorced, (laughs) Um, you know, because of that fantasy world. But um, I never really, I never heard anybody tell me, like, I needed to be, this whole person before I got into a relationship it was just also it was just this thing like no this is just a part like you've made it (laughs) kind of like when you get to that point and it was like you know if you didn't the older you got the more pressure uh people would put on you I mean I got married at 25 um and I was divorced by 31 and now but I see the cycle (laughs) coming full circle like you you 39 like uh well, what's happening where are you at with it and i'm just like i'm actually chilling like i'm fine i've I'm, accepted that this is a good life like whatever way i live is a good life yeah so I'm I, with it. I choose my my peace mm-hmm. then choosing to like force Stay something mm-hmm. that is not serving me who i am right now for the sake of other people yeah and i think through that lens of wholeness I'd say at least um, consciously, I don't remember any direct programming in that. I'm guessing that's part of my male privilege and, and like God not being not being programmed specifically. But I'd have to tell you, um, when my brother met Shamila, he's like, you got the right brother. Because since I was a kid, I was like, I was like I'm going to be a husband and a dad. And like my <laughs> brother used to get pissed. Like it would be like, what do you want to be a girl when you grow up? A husband and a dad. And no one told me these things. I think just from 
being with my parents or I don't know, I guess I, I was just like a husband. And of course, as life went on, I moved away from that idea in a sense of like it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. And when you asked me what I wanted to be, I had um, I shouldn't say actual because those are actual goals. But I had more uh, professional and aspirational goals. But um, that's still some of the funniest shit to me that like and he used to be mad like that's not a job. What do you want to be? And I used to be like, it is a job. I'm going to be. A job. <laughs> but, I would pay to see little Tristan. <laughs> like so so I don't. It wasn't anything I was conditioned um, for in a sense of like wholeness and how that fits into it. Um, I think it was just something I. It was a personal thing that I wanted for myself, but not necessarily like on a timeline or a time frame. Or I didn't necessarily think it spoke to who I was, should I say, if I, if I did or didn't, it would probably be like my own disappointment, like, but not because anyone was telling me or kind of like, Hey, like, what's up? But again, I think that's part of male versus female is I can't speak for all men, but at least for me and in my family, no one's like really harassing you. Like, when are you going to get married? Like, when are you going to people leave men alone until about 40? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. (laughs) But so so the concept of wholeness, I want to address a because I want to offer a I want to offer something that I wish I had earlier. I just found this shit in a book last week, not last week, <laughs> last year, and I can't remember the name of the book, and I tried to find it, but this is um it's shadow work. So created by Carl Jung, and it's just the concept of wholeness being that you embrace all that you are, the light in you and the dark in you. Mm-hmm. And why is this important? Because the two exist. Mm-hmm. To deny your darkness is to deny, is to deny a part of yourself. You'll act up because you're not embracing who you are and knowing who you are. And when you have come to peace and to terms with all that you are and work through some of the things, not all of them, will never be done working. That's when, and I think I say this in every fucking episode and I'm going to keep saying it, that when you have fully taken in who you are, you then that's that's what helps that's how wholeness helps relationship mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. then you're going to meet someone else and we all come with dark and light and when you see their dark you're going to extend to them the grace you have learned to extend to yourself yep. yeah and yep. that's what i think cultivates healthy relationships so women and men google carl jung and shadow work and get to it and if you feel like you don't know what to do come talk to one of us or someone in your area we you don't know, we don't have our gyms today but that definitely was a gym drop <laughs> <laughs> you know as it as it relates to that and i obviously use my wife as a reference a lot because this has been the most meaningful and substantial whether we're talking chronologically the depth the fill in the story the hurdles um so i'd say the the relationship i've had with like the most depth and I think if I was to uh, be a little transparent, we both agree that where we are now, uh, five years later, is like in this dope ass space of accepting that perfection doesn't exist, mm-hmm. but really moving out of like, so starting with the idea, like you, you caught an idea, then you start falling for the person. Then it's like that battle of like trying to mesh, but now you're just like overly suffocating self. And then like, that like fighting yourself like you're you know back against the wall and you fight yourself out the corner so it's this clash 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 and um again being transparent both of us um have done and are doing our own work in therapy so yes there we love go to, to therapy. hear it um, Tris. <laughs> and and individual therapy not not anything about couples but to me it speaks greater it would value be okay if there was something for couples yeah yeah no i'm just yeah no absolutely couples therapy i'm all here for it but i'm saying i think where, where i find the beauty is us loving one another and not necessarily going to be like, how can we be better for one another? But being like, I love you enough to go figure out my darkness. Like you said, and to I'll go figure out how to. Shamila was in my garage and it was just me and her. I think it was the first time we connected. And that's when I knew like, oh, you was a real one, Shamila. She said she had started therapy because she wanted to be as good of a wife to you as you were a husband to her. You are. I was like, shit, tears. <laughs> that's love that's beautiful mm-hmm. beautiful and, and in that although our healing journey has taken us to places by the grace of god that has nothing to do with one another again just really speaking like once you can figure it once you can identify and stand firm in that i am enough and what i want is enough it's not to say like yo fuck you like we now we just selfish but it's to say i don't want to do that or that's not for me and how can we figure out how to meet in the middle or how is it where cool that's something you do and i support you from a side or or who knows but like really moving away from this idea that we have to be like so on board and it really suffocating that individuality so 
I'd absolutely agree. And that was just my own personal testimony of how getting in touch with your dark side and learning to extend yourself grace and learning to own your own shit and figure out, hey, maybe what I'm tripping about actually has nothing to do with you. You said mm-hmm. this one thing, but to know you, that one thing shouldn't be making me feel this strongly. Like what 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 else? And sitting with self and figuring that out. So I definitely think there is a true connection um in being vulnerable to that level where you're willing to go to therapy, which I I was a therapist. I believed in therapy, but I was like, I kind of don't have a reason to go. And it's on my own being like, it was crazy because she says that she went because she wanted to be a better spouse to me. Then as I started to watch her grow, mm. not that I felt like she was going to outgrow me, but I'm like, yo, I need to grow too because I'm still old Tristan and, and she's becoming new, new Shamila and new Shamila don't don't got the tolerance or capacity to deal with old Tristan look, and look, shit. New Shamila can't even deal with old Shamila, <laughs> let alone <laughs> old Tristan. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's dope. That, that's mm-hmm. a really cool concept we didn't even plan to talk about. It's just like the function of inspiration and relationship. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You definitely don't want to be watching somebody grow and you just twiddling Damn, your thumbs. I will not get left behind. Uh, uh-huh. I'm no. tracking with you, We're out here growing mm-hmm. together, together in this mm-hmm. month. <laughs> But you know, crazy enough, and then I'll pass the mic, but when you even think about wholeness, I think that the, like that initial idea you said, like where you have to show up whole or you're not whole or complete until then, that is completely, that's in complete contradiction to what I feel like relationship true, is for. true love and relationship is. Like we can show up broken, we can figure our shit out together. And I think when people commit more to that, their relationships mm. will thrive. When they learn to love one another enough where they're like, yo, I fundamentally want to change some shit about me. Or love each other enough to be like, hey, I think you should go get help for this issue that perhaps you've been talking to me about our whole relationship or <laughs> or whatever or whatever it is. Perhaps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But wait, so you've just you tapped into something else I want to talk about. And that is that, that the misconception that you will be complete in relationship. Right. And how mm-hmm. that can be damaging, too. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it was like maybe three years ago I was in Palo Alto or something, at my girlfriend's house washing dishes. and she was playing old school songs on the radio or on whatever Sonos. Um, and Tony Braxton came on, uh, and I will never be free. Hey, get it, Robin. Rob, Rob, I knew you was going to get into it. <laughs> again. Right. They got to get, get deep with it with no, Tony. I was just like, I don't like these words. He leaves and you can't breathe. That is not what I'm signing up for. I do not need you to be my resuscitator, my ventilator. Like, uh uh-uh. But, and then I was thinking about like what we're seeing about now, it's much different. You know, we have much, like almost too far extreme, but there is an issue in this idea that you complete me without you, I don't have fullness because that creates, I think, a difficult expectation for the other person to. That's something I, like, you kind of brought me back to the point that I wanted to make when we were talking about wholeness versus, uh, lack of wholeness is that my concern is that this this lack or that we're living in of lack, like not being complete is the breeding ground for the codependent relationship mm. and so um a lot of people don't recognize that they're in codependent relationships a lot of people just feel like oh man we just love each other so much we're there for each other we're supportive of each other we're we're our ride or die partners like, More down that. for whatever whatever and then it's like when i sit down with with and talk with people who have these type of relationships who like in their mind it's like super healthy you know it's 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 good but then when i hear them talk about their partners and their partner struggles like to to move forward or to grow individually Mm -hmm. um and the person kind of like validating that state of lack of growth in a way not encouraging that partner to like fix themselves it just reminds me that codependent relationships can only survive if people stay broken mm. because you serve no purpose if yep. if you don't need if, me. if yeah yep. if you don't need me if you're if you've grown <laughs> into a place where emotionally you're not dependent on me or you're not going to fall apart without me it's like what do what I do i no do purpose. Now? right what do i do now what does that mean are you gonna be go without me or you know i haven't done any work so who's going to be there to pick up my pieces so the that's the scary part about not feeling or or feeling whole in yeah. the sense that i need to have somebody who needs me or i need to you know i need to be needed 
or I need someone who is going to be able to care for me or, or provide for me. What do you think, Pro- guys, how would people know that they're codependent? Because it, it's out there. You and took the words on my mouth. I was, just, that I was just about to say, like, for, for the listeners, can, can we kind of break down what codependency is and what that looks like? Because I think it's more common than, than people know or realize. Well, I would like to highlight that codependency exists um, in and out of romantic relationships. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. in family relationships, for it's sure. in friendships, it's, it's pretty mm-hmm. much everywhere. One way that I, a telltale for codependency is post breakup. Normal grieving is like, I think two weeks of just, you know, can't eat, can't sleep like you used to. But if you're like three months out of the relationship and still in a very sick rut, I think that doesn't mean you're codependent, but it, it does mean that that person supplied some portion of your identity. Um, and every, every situation is different. So this isn't a rule. Okay. But these are questions that we should ask ourselves. Is my identity wrapped up in what I bring to this relationship or is my identity wrapped up in who I am and what I bring to any space? Mm -hmm. What else Mm -hmm. do you think you guys think would be indicators of codependency? I'm leaning on y'all because I know what it means in my head, but I suck at explaining it. (laughs) So, so. I'll yeah, share, I I'll share an example. Practice. I didn't know I was in a codependent relationship, and I was with my little sister. Uh, the fact that I call her little sister, I think, is indicative of the fact that it's probably still there. Yeah. Is that I, my role, our family split, and I became mother-ish to her because my mother left the state, and I had to always make sure she was good. And in doing so, what I thought I was doing was extending love, and I was, but I was not enabling her allowing her to grow in her own way i was supplying so much that she didn't need to grow and even from a baby she would like reach for food and me and my sister would be like apple orange and she didn't develop words till three and the doctor's like her siblings need to stop speaking for her so we were we thought we were helping and loving and then you get older and then i see her start to break away and i become too overbearing as an adult to an adult sister and it created issues and you know, she realized some of the things she, she used to call me like, I got in an accident. What do I do? That's fine. Some people do that. But it was like that on top of like my battery's flat or my, my battery's at, where do I go? Like my, my tire's flat. My, my, I became her mom and her dad. Um, and she, we just started realizing like, we actually can't keep this up. It's a little too exhausting. Now when I'm in relationship, you're too much involved and vice versa. Yeah. If you can't function without being in contact with that person, like, I, I saw that a lot in, in, in the household that I grew up. My parents, my parents were definitely in a codependent relationship. Um, I feel like um, my dad is like great, wonderful person, but he's very dependent on like he doesn't trust himself. So he needs to be with somebody who can like validate his, his decision making or just make the decisions and make it easy for him. And my mom was very the take charge person who would just say, no, we're going to do this. And that's the, you know, he didn't have to think too hard. It was just like, Aurora is going to tell me to go here and pick up that and do this. And it's going to be fine. I don't have to worry about it. So when she passed away, I saw the anxiety Mm -hmm. that he experienced is like, Oh my God, I'm so used to somebody taking care of all this business. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I can trust myself. And he's super intelligent, wonderful and able. And he's like, he doesn't, I helped, you know, but he didn't need me. But I, I felt the, the, the need, the need w- hmm. while being there and, and being there for him. I felt the need that I, I was, you know, was beginning to kind of fill the space that my mom, you know, had left behind. And I was like, ooh, no, because I'm your daughter and I'm not, not doing all that. I'm going to help you. But you have to be able to do this on your own because I'm not going to be here for, I'm not going to be here forever. But yeah, so it was like, I saw that. I saw how that codependence plays out because when she left, how I know he was not just devastated over the loss of her, but devastated of like, what am, what am I going to do? I'm not used mm-hmm. to like functioning mm-hmm. on my own. I'm used to somebody just taking care of it. And I just do what I have to do. I play my part. And my mom, on the other hand, was more needy on the emotional side and having that companion and having that person who was dependent on her, knowing that he's not going nowhere because He's super dependent on me, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? So, but I saw how it impacted their relationship in that I looked at two people with two different love languages and they weren't compatible and they weren't compromising into meeting each other there. So that's where they experienced a lot of like strife, but the codependency kept them not necessarily moving forward and working on it, but just holding on and just like 
continue to validate that, that part. Position. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As you two discuss uh, codependency, what it's bringing to mind is uh, a book, Maiden in Captivity by Esther Pearl. Um, uh, she's a couple therapists, but I love her idea. She's not from here. Um, <clears throat> Where's she from? I don't know. It's a white woman from somewhere in the world, <laughs> but 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 she be dropping gems, and she and she ain't and she ain't from the U.S. So what I like is that she describes, and um, I may have I may have mentioned this in uh, episode one, but I'm not sure. But I'll bring it up again because I think it's relevant as we're thinking about codependency. She brings into uh, into question like this very American or Western idea that like your partner should be everything and they should be fulfilling all of these roles and now as you're you're talking it's like clicking like that's codependency like mm. in so many ways and what she says is you're in a, this book is about eroticism um so it was like you know part of her work is figuring out like where's the block like what's going on that you guys aren't getting where you need to be and what she broke down which i think is relatable to all of us is that constant self-checking to make sure that you aren't projecting this idea that your partner should be everything for you because they're not meant to be you have siblings for a reason you have friends a mom and daddy for a reason you have friends for a reason and if those relationships don't work out it's not for your partner to then feel those missing voids it's for you to heal through those and figure out how to cope and live without them but we often like to insert our partners into these spaces and duh, now your erotic life is all messed up because your wife is also your mama and your sister and your cousin and you don't get down with them like that versus had you let everybody stay in their place, then everyone could have drove in their lane. So really pushing against this idea that your partner should be everything and instead resting and knowing that I am enough. And as long as I'm enough, that's good. And you're my wife and this is my brother and this is so-and-so and learning how to keep everybody in their roles and not dumping all my shit on your plate. Oh, let me, let me take this so elsewhere. The, the key to the way to avoid or combat codependency is to uh, create and nurture more than just your romantic relationship. Would you guys yeah. say? Yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah. Do th- I think it's important to do things on your own, like whether it's reading or painting or golfing or whatever. Oh man, have your own life. Yeah. yeah. And then have your social life, right? Nurture your family life and nurture your romantic life and your professional life, right? As well. Yeah. So, so what do you think are like some... I don't want to say skills, but some like questions that people could, you know, ask themselves God. to those who are already in relationships, those who are interested in getting into relationships. What is the work that you would suggest that they need to do to make sure that they are aware of what a healthy relationship looks like for them and how to, uh, do the work for themselves to make sure that they're at least showing up and doing their part so they can, they can decipher whether the, you know, this, this partner is the best for them. I'd, I'd say in relationships, I think is definitely to ask yourself the question, um, am I honoring me and am I making space for me? And then to push yourself beyond that to, and if it's writing it down or if it's just sitting mentally in what ways am I honoring me? Cause I think sometimes it's easy to be like, no, I still do me. Cause you do these little things, but you may look up and realize you've just kind of been on autopilot and you aren't really doing the things you enjoy. Maybe, like you said, maybe you really enjoy golfing. Maybe you really enjoy like these random walks and you've little by little been sacrificing like, oh, I'm going to turn that down because I know like you wouldn't prefer that. Oh, I'm going to turn this down because I know you wouldn't prefer this. And you look up and you're like, who the fuck am I? Or like, where am I? And it's this box that I like to believe the only person you can really blame is yourself. Um, So I think it's those constant check-ins of how am I honoring me? How am I making space for me? And also revisiting your boundaries. Oftentimes people don't think boundaries can exist in intimate partner relationships, but I'd like to let all of the listeners know there's no person on this earth who gets unlimited access to you. Even your partner, you get to, (laughs) even your partner, you get to draw boundaries and not now, or maybe later, or I understand that this is frustrating, but this is something I have to do for me. And you can you can draw these boundaries and even help retrain your partner on how to show up for you and 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 yeah it's gonna be challenging it's gonna be tough but it, it's worth it and it's possible if you kind of look through that reflective lens in my in my opinion that's good I like that mine's a little it's kind of loose and this can be used in multiple realms I think and and as you guys listen to these podcasts you'll learn that I'm very I like to go very much into the visual and I think that. Um, if, if you are relying on your partner to complete you, then you're probably like 
more fixated on them than you are yourself. And mm-hmm. so I think an important practice, single or not, is to sit with yourself, close your eyes, and just visualize how you are, who you are, what you present as, how you are perceived, and how you would like to be perceived. So just spending that time nurturing yourself to remember that you present with gifts, you bring gifts, you have value, you are not just who you are in relationship, you are someone outside of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I with clients I tend to like because a lot of the clients that I have they they have they feel like they don't have a good um model for healthy relationships whether their parents weren't together or their parents had uh some some sort of dysfunctional relationship um I like to have people kind of like just look at the relationships they feel like are good in their life and what do those look like what do those people bring to that relationship what do you bring to that relationship what is what are those healthy things? Because that's partly going to also go into your romantic relationship. If you have a really good friend, your partner is going to be some similar to your really good friend, somebody who's supportive, who's there for you in certain ways, and you also are providing the same. It's like a reciprocal experience. I also like to tell people to, when you, to write down what you want in a partner, like what, what that looks like for you, and then figure out how you're showing up at, mm-hmm. on that list. You know, Because we also have to be showing up to the table with our our own things you know what i mean if you want somebody who's healthy and fit you want somebody who's intellectual you want somebody who's spiritual you want somebody who is empathetic or or um you know compassionate compassionate, whatever it is like how are you how are you also showing up as that for yourself you know are you Mm. being compassionate to yourself are you showing yourself empathy Mm -hmm. Um, Are you caring about your health? Because your self-care shows the care that you're going to put into a relationship. Yep. If you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? Yep. So on that note, to to the listeners, as always, we love to hear it from you guys. If anyone cares in as much or as little detail, just hit us with some of your stories um, or your experiences in relationships. Uh, Maybe if you ain't fucking with what we said, we open to that too. We we love to to be challenged. Not too what? much of that. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but but yeah, just bring it bring it all of the all of the feedback, any experiences whatsoever, questions. Um, hit us in our DMs on Hill and Chill AF. That's right. On Instagram. And now we're gonna shout out a therapist. She is located in Inglewood. She is a relationship therapist and she actually has worked with a few clients and family members I know on premarital counseling and everyone has given her rave reviews. She thinks outside of the box. She is about in our age range, black woman married with three kids um, and she's just really dope. So check her out. Her name is Lauren Turner, LCSW. I can't remember her IG handle, but um, you can find her on our webpage at socoray.com. Yep. And for our gym, are we done? We don't, are we going to do a gym? No. I think I think we're good. We had some gyms. Okay. I think we're good. All right. Do we get, yeah. Should we do a closeout? Do we normally do a closeout? I feel like you take lead on all of that. Do you want to do that? <laughs> all right. Um, so yeah, we already we we gonna go ahead and say we already dropped our gyms for the week. So. On that note, we're going to go on and get up out of here, and we'll catch you guys next week. Follow us on Hill and Chill AF on IG. Toodaloo. We out. We out. This has been an Inclusive Media Podcast Studios production.